Prince Charles's Point is a remarkable place where history and prehistory collide. Situated on a quiet and remote corner of Skye's Trottenish Peninsula, the once subtropical lagoonal shoreline has provided us with the best insight yet into the behaviours and environments inhabited by Scotland's dinosaurs during a key time in their evolution. Not only was it fascinating for me to research, but also to share that with you, to put you in the very spot where those megalosaurs and sauropods once wandered. But what were these dinosaurs doing on the lagoonal shoreline? How do their footprints preserve and compare with others found on the island? And what do they tell us about Middle Jurassic Sky? These are just some of your questions which I'll be aiming to answer in this video. But before I do, make sure that you hit that subscribe button to watch and learn about more research. Okay, so let's get straight to the point. Why is Skye so good for dinosaur fossils? Well, the Isle of Skye happens to have one of the most complete sequences of land-based rock that dates back to the Middle Jurassic anywhere in the world. These are rocks which were laid down in environments which included river estuaries, mudflats, or even lagoonal shorelines such as the one that I'm standing on right now, which would have had an array of smaller habitats, small forested areas perhaps, and these would have played host to an array of life forms. Animals which included lizards, salamanders, turtles, pterosaurs, and of course the dinosaurs themselves. These are places where fossils can be actively preserved, and footprints particularly. Now more land-based environments, including forested uplands, aren't really going to be fossilised because these are places that actively erode and in fact supply the very sediments that I am standing on right now. But thinking more about the dinosaurs themselves, why is it that they rapidly evolved in the Middle Jurassic? What forms did they take? And why is evidence from this time so rare? The supercontinent Pangaea at the time was breaking up. It was segregating these vast populations of dinosaurs across newly formed continents. The sea levels at the time were also rising as a result of increased volcanic activity. This in turn led to greater concentrations of carbon dioxide and higher global temperatures, which in turn led to those higher sea levels. And as a result of that, we have fewer land masses available around the world for places such as Prince Charles's Point to be preserved. For the dinosaurs, this geographical segregation was good news, as it allowed them to rapidly evolve. Supersized sauropod groups, including neosauropods and titanosauriforms, were beginning to grow tens of metres in length, like Diplodocus. Newly evolved stegosaurs sported huge protective plates on their backs. The ancestors of Iguanodon, these duck-billed ornithopods, would graze on low-growing horsetails and ferns for the first time. While lurking in the undergrowth, the smaller Proceratosaurian ancestors of T. rex. Incredibly, many of these dinosaurs are known on sky from footprints or generally isolated bones. What has Skye's dinosaur footprint record taught us about Middle Jurassic dinosaurs? On Skye, we know that theropods and sauropods predominantly lived in lagoonal environments, such as this. And the armour-plated stegosaurs and duck-billed ornithopods traversed across drier mudflats. Now, we've yet to find any evidence for those two dinosaurs in lagoonal spaces, such as Prince Charles's Point, and that might point to them being more land-based. They were more restricted than the theropods and the sauropods. And we've also learned that the dinosaurs were able to roam in a wide variety of directions, not just here at Prince Charles's Point, but at other trek sites on the island as well, which suggests that these places were wide open spaces. How has this site gone unnoticed for so long? Well, dinosaurs on Sky have really been known about since the 1980s, and any work on dinosaurs has been done since then. But what's ironic is that Jurassic-aged rock on the island has been known about since the 1800s, 
and dinosaurs were most certainly known about back then. Historically, the focus has really been on more substantial bones. So think of the big dinosaur bones that were being uncovered in places like North America, the Bone Wars. Sky, as a result of all this, got less attention. And the structures which would eventually be identified as sauropod footprints at Prince Charles's Point were initially assessed as geological structures. As far as I know, geologists have noted these since the 1980s, with interpretations since then ranging from shallow pools below small boulders called circular obstacle marks, to fish resting burrows similar to those made by modern day mudskippers. The problem with the latter theory is that mudskippers hadn't evolved in the Middle Jurassic. We now know today that these are sauropod footprints because they have that predictable left-right sequence. Some of them have toes, even their hand impressions as well. And when I first visited this site, the spot where I'm standing on right now was covered in a thick layer of seaweed. You couldn't see any of these footprints. I think it was only this one here in front of us where there was a bit of a clearing and you could just about see the free-toed impression. And it wasn't until we cleared the seaweed away, drawing back the curtains as it were, that we were able to track back this trackway and identify the two trackways that go alongside each other. And speaking of these trackways, I'll ask the question again because <laughs> I've just ended up in my own tongue twister. <laughs> I'm very good at that, I'm very good at that, but go on. So can we assume that these prints, these two sets of prints here, yeah. are the same animal, or is this different animals that have come in? So I believe that these were made by two different theropod dinosaurs, um, based on the fact that when we look in the heel region here, we can see there are clear differences in the extent to which there are ripples um, incurring into them. So we can see in the one on our left here, there, there's quite a lot more ripples going through them, whereas the one here is a lot sharper. There's less ripples going through them. Much more defined. Yeah, one. yeah. But if we come down here, we can see it's not, so very, it's not very clear now, given all the seaweed and grime that's filled it in. But um, if we look at the left hand toe of our second track maker here, you can see that the middle toe of our first track maker steps in to the right hand edge. Can you see Yeah, here? it's kind of sitting under this one. Yeah, the claw mark is sinking into the sides of this digit, which can allow us to confidently determine that this first track maker came after our second one. Okay. So there was some time averaging going on. So is this a popular track site, do you think, that the same animals have been following or...? It's probable that they came down here uh, frequently in the past. I mean, this is just a snapshot of it could be one day, it could be a several days. Uh, it depends ultimately on uh, when exactly the sediment came over the top. This is the last moment before this layer was covered over by another layer of rock. Okay. That's a wrap. Cut that, Cut that I think one. I that was good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got a little bit of extra there. Yeah. Which I can then insert. Bonus material. <laughs> Bonus material. I can insert it later on. I suppose that's a very fitting way of leading on to the next question. How did you find so many footprints here? When looking for footprints, we need to know the following. We need to know whether the rocks which they occur in are of the right age. So for dinosaurs, this can be any time between the Triassic and end Cretaceous and we need the right environmental conditions. So we need places where sediment is being actively laid down, such as the Goonal shorelines at Prince Charles's Point, mud flats, or river estuaries. And it's all about looking, noting anything that's unusual within that rock, unusual structures, and being able to question them. That's the key thing in paleontology. You've got to question whatever you see how reliable is the size of a footprint as a guide to the actual hip height and speed? Well, footprints are never going to be true representations of the foot of an animal because they've been altered by 
three different processes, the way in which the animal moved, so its locomotion, the substrate in which that foot was impressed into, so was it a soft or hard substrate, and also something called taphonomy, anything that happens after the footprint has been buried, so the fossilization process. And at Prince Charles's point, we have to look at more sharply defined footprints, the ones where the edges of the footprints can be clearly seen. If we have a footprint that's got very worn, smooth edges, it's not going to give us as reliable a metric, which is why we resort to these particular footprints. But again, we have to treat these values as estimates, as opposed to actual. And when it comes to these footprints here, I'd say we're pretty close. Yeah, tapering, one, nil. Then flangeal pads, they're pretty clear on here. That's part, that is the toe, but it's so unclear. Um, so that's a nil. And this one. Another important thing to note when recording footprints is their shape, which we categorise into groups called morphotypes. At Prince Charles's point, we have two major morphotypes, the free-toed theropods and the rounded sauropods. But when we looked more closely at the theropod footprints, we found theirs to be a lot more varied. Some sported slender toes which were much more widely spread out, perhaps a reflection of a specific form of locomotion, or even stability. Two medium-sized footprints with the characters of our larger tracks, maybe made by juveniles or a completely different track maker species, and an intriguing single footprint with the thumb claw impression present, indicating that it penetrated much more deeply into the sediment than its surrounding contemporaries. Clearly, footprints can tell us a lot about the animals that made them and their environment. Have you found any new footprints recently? Well, it's funny that you should mention that. So in the 3D model of this trackway, there was a lone raised theropod footprint which is currently under seaweed over here. But if we track backwards from that, we notice these very peculiar striations which penetrate into the displacement rims of our sauropod footprint. This here, which has pads and an elongated claw mark at the end, is unmistakably footprint. And if we track back even further, try not to trip over a boulder there, we can see another sharp claw mark penetrating into this displacement rim and fainter pads, but something that's definitely made by our theropod dinosaurs. It's a structure that I've noted elsewhere at Prince Charles's Point. And if we look to the left here, I literally found this today. I wasn't expecting this. So we've got our manus of our sauropod here, a handprint, and then opposite it is the lone toe of another theropod, which appears to be going in a different direction. And we can see the pads round here and the sharp claw mark. And yeah, it's really surreal that we just keep finding them like this. Where else on Skye can we see dinosaur footprints? More accessible locations on the island include Anchoran, which is also known as Staffin Bay. There you can find free-toed footprints very similar to these in a rippled surface. But beware the volcanic rock, because that often fools people. Brothers Point is another good location. It's certainly a good day out, with free accessible intertidal platforms very similar to this one. It's a bit more baked, but the footprints are equivalently sharp in places. You've certainly got footprints of the free-toed kind there, and even some of the most northerly occurring stegosaurs in the world. I would check out Depolo et al. 2018 and Depolo et al. 2020. Both publications have site maps of each platform in which these dinosaur footprints occur. And then there's Duntullum, a site dominated by long-necked sauropods. Again, it's reasonably easy to access. It's right opposite a road, this big platform that juts out to sea at low tide, and it's to the south of Duntullum Castle. And there you can expect to find lots, and I mean lots, of sauropod footprints. 
which occur as these raised pedestals, some of them with toes, and others as potholed depressions in the rock, which double as rock pools. So if you enjoy rock pooling, then that's certainly a place to go and explore. And lastly, there's the Staffin Dinosaur Museum, which is such an inspirational space, and it's a place that motivated me to actually become a paleontologist. It's got loads of free-toed dinosaur footprints, many the size of my hand, all laid out on these beautiful slabs that have been found over the years by their curator, Dougald Ross. I've put some of my footprints that I've found in there as well. It's such an inspiring space. It's been recently refurbished, and it's got a lot more than just dinosaur fossils. It's got a big collection of ammonites. It's got belemnites as well, so the marine animals. And it's a great place in general to learn about the island's prehistory and social history. So if you're passing through the village of Elishadda, make sure to go in the Staffan Dinosaur Museum to learn more about the island's history. That's all I've got time for today. I hope you've enjoyed watching this video. If you've got any more questions, be sure to drop them down below in the comments and like and subscribe. And yeah, thank you for watching and I'll see you again next time.